Hey everyone, thanks for joining today. I'm Xavier Harding, former tech journalist, current Mozilla content team member, and I'll be hosting today's panel titled Pursuing Platform Transparency in 2022. What the heck does that even mean? So what we mean by that is platforms like Facebook do not make it easy for outsiders to sort of pop open the hood and diagnose problems. That in itself leads to other problems. Today, we'll be talking about those problems as well as potential fixes. Joining me today are four amazing, fantastic, probably the best panelists of all time, four amazing panelists. We've got Ramya Krishnan. Ramya is a staff attorney at Columbia University's Knight First Amendment Institute. We've got Martin Rivera. Martin is the senior policy counsel over at the National Hispanic Media Coalition. Laura Edelson is back with us again. Laura is the co-director of cybersecurity for democracy over at NYU. And Marshall Irwin. Marshall is one of my coworkers. Marshall is a chief security officer here at Mozilla. That's the panel today. We've got, uh, we're taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question you want to ask of the panel, tweet at us at Mozilla with the hashtag, hashtag dialogues and debates. Um, but that's what we're talking about today. Panelists, thank you so much for joining me today. How's everyone doing? Pretty good. Yeah. Great. Right, happy to be here. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, I like to hear that. That's great. Um, okay. So let's kind of level set. What exactly is it that makes a platform like Facebook so hard to study? That can be to anyone, but maybe we should start with Laura. I mean, the beginning and end of it is kind of the lack of data. Um, this is something that I think researchers have really been struggling with for years. Uh, we have asked platforms to voluntarily provide more data. There have been numerous efforts like Social Science One is one that I know a lot of people, um, you know, followed with great hopes uh, that, you know, turned out to in practice offer a lot less than they promised. And I think um, certainly my experiences with independently studying the platform, standing up and, you know, a, an independent research effort, and then having a platform like Facebook taking pretty extreme steps to try to shut us down. Um, you know, obviously that impacts my research, but I think it also has had a chilling effect on the research community as a whole. And I think that's why we're here today having this conversation, um, because, you know, very obviously um, there are there are harms that are happening you know, society has a reason to be concerned. And the normal next step in that process of scientists and researchers try to study those problems and come up with solutions, we're getting stuck because we just don't have access to data. Yeah, yeah, Marshall, what makes it, <clears throat> what tools does uh, Facebook kind of offer, if any, that lets researchers kind of, like I mentioned before, pop up in the hood and see what's going on inside? Are there any tools? Yeah, so first to just sort of compliment what, what Laura said, you know, I think one thing that also makes uh, studying these platforms hard is, is the fact that so much of the content on them is either targeted or personalized. And that means that the content that I see is going to be different than the content that Laura sees, different than the content that Rami or, or, or Martin see, right? And what that also means is it's hard to get a systemic view of what's happening across the platform. I might know what's happening in my feed, but no one has any idea what's happening across everybody's feed. So that's kind of the other piece that like why this data is so hard is because there's no systemic view of what is happening. And, and when it comes to the tools, you know, some of the platforms have, uh, have made tools available, but but those tools are frankly meager and, and not nearly sufficient. Um, and we know we have things like ad libraries. Some of the major platforms have been, uh, have made ad libraries available. You know, the functionality there has often been very limited, not sufficient data, um, and frankly, in many cases broken. And while those tools have improved over time, frankly, they're completely insufficient to the challenges we all confront at the moment. Yeah, Martin, I'm hoping you can talk maybe about kind of the international aspect a little bit, because I think it's important to kind of establish how folks are harmed by this in the real world. Can you talk to that a little bit? Of course. Um, yes. Uh, first of all, and foremost, thank you for having me. Um, I'm uh, happy to be here. Um, but yes, the lack of transparency by platforms um, allows uh, the amplification of English and non-English disinformation and hate speech on these platforms. Um, for NHMC's purposes, we mainly focus on Spanish language content that 
as we've seen um, over and over, platforms uh, have the ability to uh, self-regulate uh, through content moderation. However, even in English, they have inadequate content moderation. But in Spanish content and non-English uh, content, they uh, it's uh, this uh, the form of uh, disinformation and exploitation of non-English speaking communities is even greater. Uh, we have seen time and time again, while some harmful English content that goes against platforms, community guidelines is removed, identical non-English um, and Spanish content is allowed to thrive on platforms. Uh, it, from an international perspective, when it comes to, for example, Latin America, we've noticed that Facebook doesn't allow the, uh, doesn't have adequate content moderation practices, or they actually resource their, uh, their content moderation practices outside and they don't take into account cultural differences uh, within different uh, countries, uh, in particular Spanish speaking countries. They don't realize uh, diff different cultural differences. And even Ms. Haugen's testimony uh, uh, last year that uh, demonstrated that Facebook itself showed a consistent pattern of underinvestment in languages that are not English. And that um, Facebook devotes 87% of its research and resources to find this information to English language content when only 9% of its users um, are English speakers. These disclosures reveal what organizations such as NAC have warned about for over a decade that rampant hate speech, disinformation, and other harmful content on social media platforms are allowed to thrive for their uh, financial gains. And this oversight is um, not just internationally, but also domestic here in the United States, as we've seen that Facebook completely disregards the needs and potential dangers to non-English speaking communities. Yeah, I want to get Rami in here. When you think about Facebook and research access, what keeps you up at night? What has you worried like, oh, I wish, wish Facebook would change this. I just hate how they do this. What keeps you up at night when it comes to that stuff? Yeah, so so many things. <laughs> I mean, there are, there are lots of reasons why um, where, you know, in this situation, I mean, people have already talked about um, the platform's insufficient uh, disclosures, the fact that the tools that they've made um, available to researchers are wholly inadequate to the task. Um, but the thing that probably keeps me up at night is something that Laura alluded to, which um, are the legal barriers that journalists and researchers currently face when they computer for an abuse act. And we've seen companies like Facebook use their terms of service as, as a cudgel against public interest research, including research that, um, that Laura has been focused on with Ad Observer. Yeah, that's such an interesting thing to think about, the idea of a company kind of weaponizing their terms of service, this document that basically no one reads. Maybe we should talk a little bit about the regulation portion of this. I think what comes to mind is the idea of limits. Um, when it comes to the problems we've endured with Facebook, how much of it is uh, related to transparency and what things wouldn't be solved with greater transparency? Maybe, Laura, you could take that one. That's a good question. I mean, I think that a lot of the harms that um, people who use social media platforms are experiencing like the fact that there is just still, still a lot of vaccine disinformation. There is still, you know, political misinformation spreading the big lie. There is still a tremendous amount of consumer fraud. Um, you know, it sounds really basic, but that's, you know, that's something that affects a lot of people online. Um, it's not going to immediately solve any of those problems. What it's going to do is allow researchers to work on solving those problems. You know, right now, it's like we're trying to we're we're trying to make a vaccine or to come up with a drug treatment before we have actually understood is this a virus or is this a germ? Have we sequenced the DNA? We just can't really effectively work on solving these problems until we fully understand them. And that is what transparency is going to allow us to do. It's going to allow a wide range of academic researchers, researchers from nonprofits to study these problems. It's going to allow journalists to report on them and to really inform people about what is happening online so that we can start working toward those solutions. Yeah, Ramia, do you feel similarly? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
there are uh, lots of problems that we face right now on the platforms, you know, disinformation, uh, political polarization, and, and just really the centralization of, of, um, of power in these platforms. And transparency isn't going to um, solve all of these problems. It's not some kind of panacea. But I think Laura is exactly right when she says that transparency is an important step to solving many of these problems because, first of all, it helps illuminate the scope of what we're dealing with here. Um, and I think by doing that allows legislators, regulators to come up with um, the kind of solutions that we need. That's good. Um, you know, Marshall, sometimes I think about all the times I've seen Mark Zuckerberg go to Congress. I've seen a lot of tech execs go to Congress and be part of these congressional hearings. And it almost feels like uh, there's a lot of uh, hearings and I guess just like visual, okay, he went to Congress, therefore the problem is solved. But it doesn't feel like there's a lot of movement there regulation wise. W what are we seeing there? Are there actually any changes happening or is it just a bunch of tech CEOs going to Congress and nothing changing? Yeah, well, not, nothing has changed yet. I think there's a lot of uh, momentum, but exactly what what's going to materialize there is a big, big open question that we are all super, super interested in. Um, the truth is, like over the past uh, almost sort of six years um, uh, since um, we, this community, I think, has been really aggressively focused on exploring uh, transparency tools, both transparency tools that we can actually deploy to our users, which Mozilla has done, uh, tools that we can get to researchers so that they can understand the problems on these platforms. Um, and that's been really a, an incredibly productive area of work. But the fact is, for all of the reasons we've already talked about, that hasn't really moved the ball enough. And we really, at this point, need um, need these sort of regulatory frameworks that actually empower user, empower researchers, protect researchers, offer them the tools, require major platforms to offer them the tools. There are a number of really promising proposals working their way, way through Congress right now that I think we want to dig into and talk about. Um, but at this point, that's where we need to see some progress is uh, this group, like I said, has done awesome work to try to protect users, to try to like build awesome tools for researchers. But that by itself uh, it hasn't moved the ball enough because it's faced basically some opposition from these major platforms. Now this sort of self-regulation plus independent research, it's not going not gonna to do the job. We need Congress uh, to act. And I do want to talk later on about the work that this group has been doing to kind of move the ball forward on this. But Laura, when what do you think of when, because I really feel like there's, I've seen Zuckerberg in front of Congress so many times, and then nothing comes of it. And I just feel like what's happening here? What is happening here? There's, uh, there's actually quite a few legislative proposals that are floating out in the ether. Um, I think should we should we talk about the bills or should we talk about like the ideas that they contain because there's a lot of cross pollination? What do you recommend? I mean, I think Let, you're the we, let's here. talk Maybe about the ideas. I think I think the ideas yeah. are more fun. Um, so I'll I'll start with the idea that I think I've spent the most time working on and thinking about, and that is universal ad transparency. So. Um, I worked on a technical standard for universal ad transparency with a researcher at Mozilla, Jason Chang, and, and several other uh, researchers um, that actually the Knight First Amendment Institute published. And the, the core concept here is that if a digital ad platform uses certain, um, you know, has certain features that we think are, you know, have the potential to be dangerous, and the ones that we highlight are um, they have a self-service ad platform, which means that they don't, uh, they don't have a, an employee vet each ad before it's allowed to be shown to users. Um, we think that that is associated with potential harm to users. We think that if a platform um, uses behavioral or interest-based targeting, which again, we've, you know, we've seen many, many times that, that that kind of targeting is both prone to abuse and it's something that consumers themselves are concerned about, uh, probably because it's prone to abuse. And then the last criteria that we offered was that if, if a platform is so large that has the ability to reach a third of the U.S. adult population, um, then they should make all of their ads transparent uh, to the public. And, um, you know, we think that each of these features can allow an ad platform to, to genuinely be dangerous to consumers. 
and you know we think that they are responsible for many of the harms um, that we're that we're experiencing right now in the ad space. And so we think that requiring that if you know if your ad network has one of these features, all you have to do is make your data transparent so that journalists can. Um, you know, look out for deceptive or harmful ads, um, something that has been shown to, um, you know, help inform the public and, and help uh, government regulators just actually know which illegal ads are, are out there and take action against them. We think that this will also help civil society groups who, um, who again, focus on consumer harm to, to particular communities who might be vulnerable to particular scams. Um, also nonprofits who focus on, again, misinformation targeting specific communities. This is something we've seen repeatedly in the, um, with vaccine misinformation, that very often it's motivated by a commercial interest that, you know, I'm gonna convince you that vaccines are not safe and then I'm gonna try to sell you something. Um, and again, we, we see those kinds of scams targeted at particular vulnerable communities. And then of course, lastly, I think it will help uh, researchers who are trying to better understand how these networks function and how safer systems so that maybe we can eventually minimize and maybe even reduce these harms entirely. I'm glad you explained in the way you did. I think uh, if I was kind of a person on Facebook, um, I, I wouldn't think for a second that like an ad could be harmful, but you're right with the misinf with misinformation, with scams, there are definitely ways that even an ad on Facebook be harmful to someone just kind of scrolling through Facebook, not expecting harm to happen via an advertisement on their, on their feed. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you kind of brought it to the portion where we're talking about the work that you're doing. And I kind of want to hear all of you the work that you're doing. Maybe next we can go to Martin. We haven't heard from you in a while about, you know, maybe like the work you're doing or the proposals here that you're working on on this topic. Yes. So an agency uh, has noticed how the lack of transparency leads to a lack of content moderation for harmful content and scams and fraud uh, to uh, all users, but in particular uh, communities of color. Um, and it's usually done for the financial gain of these platforms is either, uh, as Laura mentioned, um, uh, cure-alls uh, for COVID-19, false information on, on COVID-19 and vaccines. However, uh, another incentive these platforms have is that by creating this hateful and disinformation, uh, this hateful content and disinformation, platforms, they're encouraging engagement on their platforms, and that way they increase advertisements. So one thing outside of Congress and uh, outside of the current legislative proposals that are out there is rulemaking through federal agencies such as the FTC. For example, the FTC can implement and enforce rules to prevent unfair and deceptive practices that unjustifiably harms consumers. By regu regulating false content, fraud, scams, the FTC can better protect businesses overpaying for ads and protect consumers from harmful content that promotes unfair or deceptive practices. Uh, for example, uh, in 2019, uh, fraud and disinformation was projected to cost advertisers $5.8 billion, um, which often led to a distortion of markets. Um, again, if platforms are allowing false and sat unsubstantiated content on their platform, that is likely uh, violating FTC's prohibition on unfair and deceptive practices. So uh, as we move forward, uh, obviously there are still uh, further things that we need to do, such as pass current uh, legislative proposals that are in Congress, both in the House Energy and Commerce Committee um, and in the Senate uh, Commerce Committee as well. But there are still steps that federal agencies can take now to start addressing some of the harms we, that have been revealed within the last year. You said $5.6 billion, that's a lot of money. Yeah, 5.8. Five, 5.8 5. 5. billion dollars. Um, wow. Ramya, uh, what are some of the things you're working on over at Night First Amendment Institute in terms of this? Yeah, so the piece that we've been working on, you know, in light of the nightmare I told you about um, earlier on, uh, you know, which is just this threat of legal liability looming over journalists and researchers who are studying the platforms in the public interest. We have been working on developing legal protections for those journalists and researchers. Um, or what we, you know, we've sometimes called a, a safe harbor for public interest um, research. 
And we see the safe harbor as complementary to any kind of disclosure regime Congress enacts, whether um, that involves mandating the disclosure of information about ads, as Laura has suggested, or high engagement content, as I think Marshall is going to speak to later. Um, and that's because even if the platforms ultimately share more data, researchers and journalists still need a way to verify that data. And some of my colleagues have referred to this as, uh, as the Volkswagen problem after the story about Volkswagen feeding regulators with uh, dodgy data by essentially programming cars to reduce their emissions when they were being tested oh, no. for compliance with environmental regulations. Yeah, it sounds I crazy. Hear about that. Right? Yeah. No, yeah, it's totally. To yeah, it's bonkers. And you know, we need to protect ourselves against that problem with the um, with the platforms. We also need to just guard against the sort of more garden variety errors that um, platforms have a track record of making when they compile. Um, but the challenge, as I mentioned before, is that uh, journalists and researchers currently face um, real legal obstacles to collecting um, information from the platforms independently and directly. And that's what a safe harbor would sort of be addressed to. Um, and we released just this morning, the Knight Institute, I mean, released this morning, a policy paper explaining um, what the safe harbor would look like, and it included um, draft legislative language uh, that essentially made its way verbatim into um, one of the bills uh, that, you know, Laura alluded to, uh, um, a draft bill announced by Senators Coons, Klobuchar, um, and Portman, the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act. But what the safe harbor would do is um, immunize from legal liability news gathering and research projects that involve collecting information from the platforms where those projects satisfy a number of conditions. And these conditions are essentially geared to protecting the privacy of platforms users, as well as the integrity of the platforms um, themselves. Uh, but we see this as a really important um, step, uh, first step, I think, to be to, to address you know, many of the issues that we've already talked about. Um, uh, that exist on the platforms and then causing real world harms um, right now. Yeah, that, that reminds me of journalist friends of mine who will, you know, scrape Facebook for certain information. And according to Facebook, certain things they're doing is like not allowed. But it's like, well, how can we get information from you at all, Facebook? Because you don't let us, you don't give, you don't give us a way in. You don't let us, you know, use our own magnifying glasses to search for information. What are we allowed to do? And I guess by Facebook's preference, nothing. Like you would not be able to do anything. So I think that's important work that you're working on. Okay, Marshall, I want to get you in here as well. What are you working on? Yeah, so I'll say we're sort of strongly supportive of the ideas that we've already mentioned here. The um, universal ad transparency uh, has been an, uh, an area we've been focused on for a long time, pushing on that idea in the Digital Services Act. Um, I think they're, again, Europe leading the way uh, on the, in this area in a really healthy healthy way. And then Robbie mentioned the, the safe harbor. We uh, offer a, what we call our, our rally project, which is building a, a sort of data research platform uh, that can offer, we can offer to researchers to run studies against uh, major, major tech platforms, um, which we think potentially could be super powerful. But a plat research platform like that isn't going to be as useful if the researchers using it can be sort of sued to oblivion by major tech companies with massive legal teams, right? So that's a really key component. And massive war chests. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the, the other area that I'd mentioned that we have been focused on more recently is what we call disclosure of high engagement data. So the basic idea here is you would establish a legal requirement that platforms would disclose uh, content and data about that is getting very high levels of engagement. So content produced by people with sort of tens or hundreds of thousands of, of followers or content uh, that is, is viewed by hundreds of, of thousands or even millions of, of people. Um, sometimes people refer to this, this requirement as because the crowd tangle requirement modeled off of Facebook's crowd tangle program. But it's useful to think about this in the context of, for example, a platform like YouTube, where driving a huge amount of viewership, content that's available to everyone, uh, but yet we don't have a systemic understanding, again, of, of how uh, that content is being viewed and what's really influencing people. 
So a requirement like this, this kind of crowd tangle type requirement, disclosure of high engagement uh, data, we think is really critical. Um, again, the idea here being this data is essentially public in some way anyway, it's getting massive levels of engagement. Um, and so it doesn't raise the a disclosure requirement. If you set the, the threshold correctly, it doesn't raise significant uh, privacy issues, but at the same time, uh, gives a strong signal into the information ecosystem and what's really shaping people's views online. You know, issue or just thing, it makes me think of a quote and the quote goes, there are two reasons to do something. One is a good reason, one is the real reason. You know, Facebook says they want to connect the world's people. You know, they just benevolently just want to connect the world's people. But the real reason is because they want to make a lot of money. When we think about high engagement, I think about Facebook's business model. It feels like whether it's right or wrong, Facebook will do it because it's going to make them a lot of money. And then when Ramya talks about Volkswagen and their past actions, which I just learned about, just how companies will do things when, even if it's kind of shady, it's like, all right, well, this is going to keep us making money. You know, where, where <clears throat> how, I just have so many questions. It's like, how do we square this circle of like, what Facebook, what makes Facebook money is doing the not so great thing, but we're also trying to urge them to do the thing that will make them less money. How do we go about squaring that circle? I don't know who that question was for. Does anyone want to take that? I have, Mara? I have thoughts. <laughs> I mean, I think, okay. right, this is the, this is the classic question in, in like liberal democracy, right? In li liberal capitalistic democracies, companies are in business to make money for their shareholders if they're public. And, you know, there are times when a, you know, what is it in the interest of a company is not in the interest of society at large. And this is the role that government regulation has always played, right? We regulate banks because banks are, Necess they're like a necessary part of our economy. We recognize that, but we also recognize that they have the capacity to do harm. We regulate the pharmaceutical companies. We regulate food producers because all of these all of these types of businesses can really do great harm, but are part of our modern world, and we wouldn't really want to ban them. So we find a way to balance you know, that specific interest with the interest in society at large and like not, you know, not having their money stolen and not being fed a pack of lies. Um, and I think, I think that's where, you know, but of course it's an evolutionary process. And I think that's why we're seeing these different ideas um, that are, you know, that are being talked about. We've, we've sort of talked about, I think, three of the, the biggest ones. And, you know, the Pato bill obviously incorporates um, all three of these. There are other bills out there that have focused on, you know, only one or two pieces. But I mean, I, I think right now, what we need to do is just get to that place where we better understand the harms. Yeah, yeah Martin, I, I feel like... <clears throat> Oh, yeah, go ahead, Marshall. Yeah, just to add to this this uh, question that you have about the business model, to me, it's a it's an issue of underlying incentives. You know, all of the incentives that they face right now, the major platforms face, are to keep people addicted on the platform, keep people engaged to maximize uh, ad revenue. And frankly, there aren't enough countervailing incentives, things that can actually hold them accountable to force them to solve for things in a better way. That's why these mechanisms we're talking about today are really so critical. But again, we mentioned earlier, transparency isn't an end in itself, but it really can potentially power a lot of other second, second step accountability efforts that can really shift those incentives in a meaningful way. Because until we do that, you know, things, it's, it's basically going to be status quo. We're going to continue to see the harm. That's, that's okay. Yeah, well, I was going to ask of Martin or even Ramya, anyone who wants to chime in, I think on the one hand, the excuse for why is this happening is because it's a nascent industry. It's relatively young. But also, you know, it was founded in 2004. It's coming up on 20 years. We've had Facebook, and Facebook isn't even the only, the oldest social media network. At what point, Martin or Ramya, do we say like, okay, it's it's done enough damage. Let's start to like actually like, I know this is going to make you billions of dollars every year, but don't do this because it's bad for us. Maybe Martin could take that one. Yeah, I would say that um, the time for action is now. That's why, especially given the last year from the 20, uh, 20 election to January 6th, 
even before that, where we saw hidden disinformation on these platforms, which again, create, uh, creates greater enhancement, uh, brought upon a real world harm, such as the El Paso massacre. So there, there's no time to uh, wait for the next Congress. Uh, the good thing is that there's, as uh, Laura has mentioned, there's several pieces of legislation and that has bipartisan support in Congress. However, we, we can always, uh, again, because con Congress does tend to move slow when it comes to these issues, that's why uh, existing authorities, uh, such as I mentioned, the FTC, also through the DOJ, um, to make sure that civil rights protections are uh, protected and to the FTC to make sure that unfair and, and deceptive practices are not continued. Uh, one of the issues that we've seen uh, previously with, uh, for example, for the FTC is that they have gone after Facebook for the abuse of, of using users' data for marketing purposes. Now, because of the SEC uh, revelations by Haugen and the reporting by the Wall Street Journal, we've seen that they are using uh, users' personalized data for their financial gain, even if it's harmful content, even if it's uh, issues dealing with uh, body dysmorphia, whether it's with election uh, disinformation. Uh, these platforms are not have not been held accountable in the time for self-regulation. It's basically over. And again, just for our community, for the Spanish-speaking community, um, and for non-English speaking communities, and uh, for the whole country, if we don't stem uh, the rampant disinformation and hate online, while still protecting First uh, Amendment free speech uh, content, we're going to see these harms become more often and more dangerous as we as we continue. Yeah, Ron, man, my question for you is, um, you know, when we know how much Facebook makes each year, we know how profitable the company is in its current state. What, what keeps you from losing hope when you vouch for keeping journalists and researchers protected and researching the company? You know, this is a company that can lobby the government. This is a company who has a lot of sway over things. What keeps you motivated and not feeling like you want to give up and say, well, this is, I think a lot of people in the audience may be thinking, well, what's the point of even trying to fight it? Because billion dollar, multi-billion dollar company, 2 billion users, what's the point? What keeps you going and fighting for people to be able to research Facebook? Yeah, I mean, I think that's <laughs> it's a really great, great question. I can understand why, you know, some people might be um, losing hope right now, but I actually think that, um, we're currently in this window of real possibility. I think the case for action has been mounting um, for years, but it's really, really building now. And there seems to be genuine appetite um, among lawmakers and regulators um, to do something about it right now. Um, and on platform transparency specifically, I mean, Laura mentioned that there are a number of bills out there. Um, and certainly like, you know, Many people on the Hill have like reached out to a number of people on this panel to talk about like what they can do. Um, so that's something that keeps me from, from, from losing hope. Um, I think the other thing that keeps me from losing hope is people like Laura, who, you know, I mentioned that they face real um, threats, um, you know, under the law right now. You know, they have, you know, they met like Facebook shutting down their accounts. And um, I think a lot of people in that position would feel really fearful about um, doing the kind of work that we need them to, uh, that the public so desperately needs them to do. But um, there are really brave people like Laura right now that um, are not putting down their pens and then continuing on with their research. We just shouldn't require journalists and researchers to have that sort of, you know, superhuman, um, uh, you know, appetite for, for risk. Um, and so that's why Congress really needs to, needs to act now. You know, the theme of this panel, I think, is what's keeping Rami from losing sleep and like losing hope. Those are the two like overarching questions. Yeah, shout out to Laura, who was on this panel. Yeah, it's superhuman level energy, but you shouldn't have to have superhuman level energy to start to combat these things. I should mention that also for people watching, feel free to tweet at us your questions at Mozilla with the hashtag dialogues and debates. We're gonna take questions very soon. Um, so tweet at us those questions and we will ask them to our panelists of guests right now. Um, yeah, maybe Laura, I can ask you the same thing in the meantime, what keeps you going? Because there's, this is the biggest social network of all time. 
biggest social network we've ever seen in history. I can't think of any other company that has 2 billion users around the planet, maybe McDonald's or like maybe like, <laughs> I, I don't know, but like what keeps you hopeful? Um. I really think we are going to see mandated legislation this year. I, I really genuinely think that because I think there is, I think we've reached the point where the severity of the problem is undeniable. Um, I, I just checked and we're uh, 1,889 people died of COVID in the United States yesterday. The fact that that is happening when we have safe and effective vaccines. You know, misinformation isn't the only thing killing people, but it's it's a contributing factor. I, I think that we, at this point, you know, there are a lot of people in government, both, you know, legislators and regulators who understand the severity of the problem and they want to do something about it. And that's why we are seeing several bills. And now, you know, this is where we in the, in the civil society community and the technical community and the legal community, we have to do our part. You know, we have to do what we can to understand what's in these bills, to think through them and try to, um, and try to help people who are trying to to craft these bills, make them you know robust, make them privacy protecting, um, and make them things that platforms can actually comply with, so that we can start solving these problems. I know so many researchers who desperately want to work on these problems, and they just need the data. I know, I know that if we can pass transparency legislation in the next year in this country, that it really will unlock a wave of academic research, of nonprofits who are gonna try to understand how this, um, how these problems impact specific communities. And it is gonna unlock a lot of um, reporting on how this is playing out in real time. And we need that. We need that if we're going to, you know, have a safer and fairer and freer election in this country in, in 2024. You know, we need this globally because as bad as this problem is in the United States, it is significantly worse overseas. So I think, you know, we are at the problem, at the, we are at the point where everyone recognizes the problem. We have some ideas about what the solutions will be. And now we just, we need to do it. We all need to step up and work so that we can all figure out like, what does transparency mean this year? And we need to do it. Yeah, that's a very good point. All right, let's go to questions from the audience. So far, we only have one, it looks like, and it's a question from Marshall. What kind of tools could solve the transparency issue? And can we come up with a tool that efficiently lets us look inside the platforms working, but maintain user privacy at the same time? That's yes, Marshall. The um, privacy issue is one that we've been really focused on recently. I think from Mozilla's perspective, what we don't want to see is a regime that sort of allows us to have more platform accountability, more transparency but sacrifices user privacy. That to, to us is a sort of losing proposition. Um, and that's why we wanna make sure that privacy actually stays sort of front of, front of mind in all of, all of these proposals. Um, so the, the, the good news though, is if you actually look at Safe Harbor proposal, the sort of high engagement, uh, disclosure of high engagement data, and especially the sort of ad, a universal ad library, we feel like there are really smart solutions here that let us get the level of transparency we want uh, without actually sacrificing user privacy. So like a good example, again, thinking about Laura's work um, on the, the ad observers uh, we've talked about um, previously, you know, that's a tool that gives an important level of transparency, but it's also designed in a really smart way to protect users, to make sure that it's not creating privacy risk. And then what we wanna do is make sure that there's kind of a legal architecture basically systematizing that. But I think it's a, that tool is a really good proof point for why I think these tools can provide the level of transparency we want, but without it, especially and everyone watching like, really thinks through and tries to tackle. At the same time, there are what I sometimes think of as for pretextual privacy arguments or false arguments put forward by the major platforms who are trying to ward off the transparency and regulation in this space. And I frankly just don't give those much, much credibility. That's why I think it's important for us to concern ourselves with the privacy issues, not just to solve for the researcher equities here, rather than just leaving it to the major platforms to make these kind of pretextual privacy arguments instead. 
Yeah, it feels like if you left it to the platforms to do so, they would just do whatever makes them the most money, even if they don't say that out loud. Laura, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just I just wanted to follow up with what Marshall said. Uh, you know, I completely agree that we do have to balance transparency with user privacy. And I think that that's absolutely possible. You know, I think we really showed that effectively in the universal ad transparency standard. I think it's something we practice every day in, um, you know, with ad observer. Um, I do think though, that there are serious, important questions that independent researchers need to look into that are inherently going to um, involve data that, uh, that relates to specific users, that is private data. And um, I think this is where there's an interesting proposal out there. Uh, Nate Persilli was really the champion of this. This is something else that has made it into various pieces of proposed legislation. And this is the idea that um, the NSF would vet specific researchers and research projects, and then it would work with platforms to allow those independent researchers to have access to platform specific data in a in effectively a clean room where researchers could you know access data not be able to take any data out but just be able to answer specific questions um, and then you know and then work from that i think that you know i think this is something that a lot of people need to to read and to think about. There are safeguards built in there. There are penalties for researchers who, um, you know, who who don't handle data responsibly, compromise user privacy in, in an end result. But I think it's at least a starting point for uh, thinking about how this kind of thing could be done because I think it is needed. I think that what one of the things that we all know now that we've seen. And now that we've lived through the Facebook papers is that there are really serious harms happening and we just, we can't allow platforms to be the only, uh, the only actor who can research uh, harms that happen on platform. And I think some kind of mechanism like this is going to be needed. Yeah. Can I just add one more thought to that? I think <laughs> sure. It's, it's important to think like all of these proposals, I think work in partnership. And we tend to think of it as kind of a toolbox that 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 we should have in place. So there's certain data that uh, or content that shouldn't be collected as part of the safe harbor, shouldn't really be making its way into sort of a universal ad library. And that's why this clean room sort of idea is quite important to make sure that we are able to solve that particular use case of like key research questions that really need a much more higher level of privileged access subject to a strong set of controls. And then we have a second set of use cases that we might solve with the safe harbor and another set of use cases that we might solve for the universal ad library. So all of them are important to, to keep in mind. None of those solutions by themselves quite gets us what we need, but I think that tool set uh, in total, I think is potentially really valuable. And Laura said helps to anticipate and solve for some of the privacy issues. Cool, got it. We have another audience question. Uh, from Caitlin Bocas. The last question, by the way, was from Manic Berry. Thanks, Manic, for your question. This one's from Caitlin. Should researchers have access to users' non-public content? And how do you draw the line between what's public and non-public? Should users be required to opt in to sharing their content and other data with researchers? I kind of want to prioritize uh, giving Martin and Ramya dibs on this one. And if you both don't have anything you want to add on it, then getting Marshall and Laura back in there. But who wants to take this one? Does anything come to mind when you hear that? non-public content versus public content? Um, I think that, that Laura and Marshall are probably better place to answer this question. Okay. Um, I will just start off by saying that actually, I think the question of what is um, public is, a, is actually a difficult one in part because of the variation that we see among platforms and, and also the fact that, you know, platform design might change over time. And one way that we tried to get at that um, question in our safe harbor, because one of the categories of information that the safe harbor is to protect the collection of is publicly available data, is by sort of punting that question to the Federal Trade Commission, because we think that it actually is this really nuanced question. Um, and obviously, we don't think that the mere fact that information is public means that you know users don't have any kind of privacy interest in it. 
we thought that that was a question that should be addressed on this sort of like granular level. Um, but I'm curious to hear what, you know, other pa panelists have to say on that. Yeah. Um, yeah so am I. Oh yeah. I just have to agree uh, with what you said, Rami. Uh, basically the FTC does have that authority and um, while there are pieces of legislation right now that are being considered, uh, it's a careful balance that we have to do to ensure that there's more transparency from platforms while pres preserving privacy protections. Um, that's why I believe that uh, ongoing conversations with advocacy organizations such, such as ourselves and independent researchers uh, to find that careful balance, especially when it comes to rulemaking authority or any of the legislative proposals right now being considered, that we uh, we should provide that input to make sure that that careful balance is preserved with any imp uh, laws that are implemented or rules uh, for each particular agency, such as the FTC. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, public, non-public, Laura Marshall. I think we have to make another distinction here. And that distinction is between user data held by users and user data held by platforms. User data held by users I, I really believe, and I think this is sort of supported in our current legal structure, users who hold their own data should have a right to do whatever they want with their own data. If users want to participate in, you know, citizen science research, like my project, I believe they should have a right to do that. If you're, heck, if users want to sell their own data, that's what data ownership means. It means that you have a right to do things that you want with your data. And so I think, I think that that to me, I, I really feel like we always have to allow users to choose to opt into projects where they control their own data. So, so that's one piece. There, then there's the other piece of platform held user data. And that's where I, I you know, if it's, if it's private data, then, you know, I think this is, this is frankly, this is the space where that clean room proposal is, is probably the, the safest and most important one. I mean, I think, again, we have seen that there is real harm that is happening on platforms that is, is not that like, that gets into mental health risk and even gets into physical, you know, physical health risk with, um, you know, some of the harms that are clearly happening to people around, um, you know, things like suicidal ideation, uh, you know, things like self-harm, you know, these are real, these are real health problems that platforms may, may be contributing to. And I think it is important for um, health researchers to be able to study that, not just platform specific researchers. And if that is gonna happen, then we need some way for those researchers to safely access platform data, even if it is in some cases, private user data. Obviously, there are, as Marshall would speak to, massive privacy risks. So constructing a framework to do that safely is going to be a lot of hard work. I also just believe that the public health risks are, are, so, are so grave. We need to be thinking about what a solution would look like. You got it. So when you mention data that users should own versus data that the platform owns. In my, in my mind, let me know if these examples are accurate. So data that users should own. The, the photo I, would, I would say to held to versus held. own, right? Because in either case, okay. the user owns their own data, but they might, they like the platform sometimes holds data that is owned by users and sometimes uh, users hold that data. That's a very, that sounds like government court ready. So I like that distinction. <laughs> um, so in my mind, I'm picturing it as photos I upload, Status updates I up I send to Facebook. Those that's my data versus maybe metadata saying Xavier logs in five times a day. That's probably platform data. Is that the right distinction? Are those good examples? So in the case in the case of um, that photo, you hold that photo in your browser, right? When you upload it or when you view it. Like if you go to view like your photo album, Facebook literally sends those images to your computer, right? So at that moment, you are holding that data, uh, but Facebook also has a copy. So, so basically anything that you are, are any, of, any of your data, like when you type out a post on Facebook or you create a link, that's your data uh, that you hold at that time and then you pass it to Facebook and Facebook does other stuff with it. But, um, but you are, you, there's a, a point in time where you're holding it. And if you want to do something with that, I think you should have the right to. Got it. All right, we have 
question. And then from there, mm-hmm. I, I think I should go to the kind of final wrap up. We're running low on time. I don't want to go over an hour, unfortunately. Sorry, Marshall. That's I want fine. to have time for all of your great final takeaways. Uh, so hoping to make time for that. The last question I think could probably go to Ramia. We have a question from Bogdana Rakova. Uh, we actually have more questions now. Uh, I'm going to go with the one I originally landed on. Are there examples where legal agreements, terms of service, or other agreements have actually protected journalists and academic invest- academics investigating these issues? Hashtag dialogue and debates. Ramya, have, are there examples of times where it actually has protected or is it usually not protecting journalists and academics? I think it's generally not protecting um, journalists and academics because, and um, you know, <laughs> this is like, the, the terms of service are drafted by platforms, um, you know, and and the, and I don't think, I mean, they're often referred to as like in laws, like contracts of adhesion, which just means that they're, they're presented on this like take it or leave it basis. Like users don't have any ability to sort of like meaningfully like negotiate over those terms um, before they agree to them. And so obviously the platforms are going to draft their terms in a way that's beneficial to them in a way that protects those business interests that we've been talking about. Um, and in general, those terms um, across all of the major platforms, as I said, they they prevent journalists and researchers from using just the basic tools of um, digital investigation. Uh, they even prevent former users from, from doing so as well. So like one of the terms that Facebook, for example, includes in its terms is um, even if we, you know, shut down your account, you no longer um, have any relationship with us, you're still bound by all of the restrictions in these terms, um, which is a massive abuse of power, really. Um, so <laughs> Much aware of like any instance where it's actually sort of protected um, journalists and researchers for the most part, it, it you know it hurts them. Yeah, which makes the work that you do so important. Okay, so I'm sorry about the other questions on Twitter that we're not able to get to at this moment, um, but still send them in anyway, and maybe panelists or Mozilla can maybe send a response over on Twitter after potentially, possibly. So, final takeaways. I want to hear from each of you just kind of one takeaway you want to leave our audience with? Maybe we can start with Martin. Sure. Um, Yes, I believe uh, an NHMC uh, believes as well that to prevent the dissemination of English and non-English disinformation, hate speech, and other harmful, harmful content, we must demand more transparency from platforms. That means generalized data, such as how platforms choose how to advertise to certain communities, uh, demographic groups, and groups with, uh, that use different languages, and how they differentiate on content and advertising based on individual cultural differences within those communities. But we also, as we mentioned earlier, we have to ensure that we preserve privacy protections. Yes, we do need uh, legislation, and that is urgent right now. Uh, but we can start um, making steps uh, towards more accountability, uh, more platform accountability through uh, regulatory means that currently exist. But at the end of the day, this is an issue that it is moving. It does have bipartisan support. So uh, as Laura mentioned and uh, uh, other panelists here mentioned, uh, I'm hopeful that there will be movement on this year legislatively to actually adequately address these issues and provide the transparency that we need going forward. Got it. Maybe we can go to Ramya next. Sure. Well, I agree with all of that. I think sort of my takeaway is just that we can't let these companies be the gatekeepers to um, information and research about how they work and what impact they're having on us. Um, because something that's come up again and again, I think, in this discussion is that their interests just don't map onto the public interest. And so we need Congress to step in to protect the public interest by passing transparency legislation now. Got it. Uh, Marshall? Yeah, I mean, this, this question has come up a few times about what, what to be and, and why, um, you know, there are a lot of really challenging issues related to content, content regulation that I think we shouldn't have a lot of hope will, will be tackled. But this is one area where I think there's a lot of potential traction and viability because the basic idea that you need to, we need to protect researchers, they need tools to do their job, ads should be transparent. That's whatever particular harm that we're concerned about at the time or wherever you sit on the 
on the, on the spectrum, that set of ideas, I think, is one that can get broad consensus and that we should be hopeful can, can move forward. And that's why we're, we're focused on this work and think it has some real. Got it. Final word, Laura. I think, like everyone else on the panel, I am actually really hopeful for what we're going to be able to get done this year and what that is going to mean for, um, you know, for the future. Uh, but that's only going to happen if people get involved in some of the uh, debates around what this transparency legislation needs to look like, what, which ideas um, can support each other. And so I'd, I'd really encourage people to get involved in some of those conversations around what transparency proposals are needed. And frankly, just to reach out to your elected representatives, let them know that this is an issue that matters to you because that is ultimately how we are gonna get them. Got it, All right. Well, thank you so much to our panelists for joining me today. Thank you for folks on Twitter who sent in your questions. I'm really sorry that we were not able to get to all of the great questions on Twitter. Um, but yeah, panelists, if you have time, feel free to answer those separately, just a tweet. But Yes, thank you everyone for watching and joining. You can follow me at I am Xavier on Twitter. You can follow Mozilla at Mozilla on Twitter, Instagram. We're on TikTok now, doing TikTok things. Follow, follow our panelists. And panelists, thank you so much for joining me today. It was really great talking to you all. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us.